Thanks for taking the time to speak with us, Reverend Wilson. The first 13 deaths in St. Louis uh, from the coronavirus uh, hit the African-American community specifically. And as of this recording, there have been 18 total deaths in the St. Louis area and 14 of those deaths have been African-Americans. Can you give me a little background? Yeah, so it's an interesting story. So the first 13 deaths in St. Louis City were all African-American people. Um, when we looked around the same time frame, so this was late March uh, at St. Louis County, we saw that 55% uh, of the cases were African-Americans, where African-Americans only make up 24% of the county. Can you give me a sense of how those numbers compare to the overall Metro St. Louis area population? Um, to give that context in the city, African-Americans are only 49% of the city's population. So less than half the population, 100% of the COVID-19 deaths. Um, I'll add another wrinkle just because I think it matters. Uh, in the city, the first death was a 31-year-old Black woman who worked for the Red Cross. In St. Louis County, a uh, little bit older, but not uh, anyone in the, um, uh, in the category of elders who we would have um, called at, at risk, uh, but you had an African-American woman who was a nurse uh, who was the first death in the county. And so I think there's some context to both of these. Um, number one, um, Black women are in many ways the face of death uh, for this crisis in St. Louis. While they're not the only ones, Black people are the face of death, Black women who are caregivers, who work in social services, seeking to care for others, are the first deaths that we come to know in this moment. Uh, and so some of that has to do with um, the orientation of, um, so I'll, I'll get into, of course, his, historical health inequities, uh, but it also has to do with the orientation of Black people uh, to be uh, folks who are serving, uh, folks who are frontline workers, and folks who in this moment have been deemed essential workers, mm -hmm. um, even though in other moments we would not have called them such. Mm -hmm. uh, so these black women in their faces, I see also the faces of every single grocery clerk and cashier on my weekly grocery runs mm -hmm. in St. Louis uh, as the person who goes forth to get groceries in this moment yeah. uh, from my house, right? Mm -hmm. So I expose, you know, I go into that space uh, that is an exposed space that is still an essential space and is primarily supported and served by black women. Yeah. Uh, so, so of course we have first, I think we, we shouldn't lose the fact that black people are predisposed to these serving professions, predisposed to be frontline workers. So in this moment with other shelter in place, black people are still having to go outside their homes to make sure that, that we can make it through this moment. Yeah. And that's everyone from the cashiers to the postal worker who served my house. Right. Um, the other piece, of course, is um, the historic inequities. And, you know, the, the language of comorbidity has uh, cropped up in our, in our um, communities. So, yes, there is a matter of um, the fact that we are um, historically hypertension is high in our communities, uh, diabetes is high in our communities. Um, and that is not just about our behavior. Um, that is actually about um, uh, access to care. Um, so at the same time that we see... Um, a Red Cross worker and a nurse be the first people to die in our community. Mm -hmm. We're fighting um, at the end of this month, we'll turn in the, um, the signatures to fight to get Medicaid expanded mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in the state of Missouri mm -hmm. um, so that folks who are positioned like these young uh, workers and caregivers uh, from the cashiers to the nurses to the Red Cross workers actually have access um, to, uh, to health care. Mm -hmm. um, so that lack of access to care um, the frontline nature of uh, Black folks in this economy um, uh, and those historic inequities um, absolutely have everything to do uh, with us having 13 Black people to die before anyone else, mm -hmm. uh, even though the first cases were not identified among Black people in the St. Louis community. We're speaking on April 19th. Uh, what are public health officials saying right now about when your community is going to be reaching its peak in terms of the virus hitting St. Louis? So the, uh, the models that we see out of um, the University of Washington model that a lot of folks were watching early on to, to see when the peaks are uh, suggested that Missouri would reach its peak on May 18th. Uh, I know some others have begun to look at other models since then, uh, but, uh, but that's the one that's been most widely used. So, so no, we don't believe that we're at our peak. 
uh, which is why, quite frankly, many of us are quite concerned yeah. about this conversation about reopening um, the economy. Uh, and, um, and quite frankly, in Missouri, we have to push pretty hard uh, to even get a stay at home order from our governor. Uh, we had them in the city and we had them in the county, but uh, we didn't have them uh, at the state level. So you mentioned that the first two deaths in the St. Louis area were black women. And you've also told me that the, uh, there's a regional health commission that is chaired also by uh, two other black women in the area. Uh, and yet when the pandemic hit, this regional health commission that included a large group of people in healthcare in the region was somehow supplanted by a pandemic task force that had real, in, and, and that had real impact on the black community. Can you talk a little bit more about that and explain how that happened? Yeah. So I'll describe the two. The Regional Health Commission is a coordinated regional table that has representation of the hospitals, the federally qualified health centers, and the health department and community representatives. Okay. It is the only table that has all of those people at it okay. in its leadership and on its board. Okay. The integrated health network is the network of the federally qualified health centers who primarily serve black people. Okay. Um, and so I said that to say, the only table, we actually had an institutional table where all the parties who needed to be around the table to respond to a health crisis mm -hmm. were gathered. What we chose to do was to create another table where the only people who were not there were the federally qualified health centers who disproportionately serve black people. Wow. So our response, our institutional response yeah. was biased from the beginning. Yeah. And, and, and I'll give a, one quick example of what we may have done earlier had we paid attention to the table that was before us, the table that was set before us. Mm -hmm. um, those in this moment marginalized black women work behind the scenes to coordinate a team of community health workers, more than 100 community health workers in coalition to develop, to provide PPE, to develop packets, and on their first outing, provided 3,000 units of PPE and personal care to, to citizens who've been marginalized, largely black and brown people, right? That was their first coordinated act. That body put together an emergency response fund to support healthcare workers and social services uh, and, and, and put up the first testing sites in black communities mm -hmm. um, through those fellow to qualified health centers. Had we started there, then perhaps we would have a different death count. Right. Had we started there, perhaps we would have different communications. Right. Um, but we started with the most moneyed and mainstream entities where people who had the most access to care right. were sitting right. and created a table for them. <laughs>